Hi, in this video we're going to be looking at a recent study that was done or an analysis of various different studies that were published in 2022. So this is looking at the prevalence rates of depersonalization and derealization disorder, which is a very, very difficult experience for people experiencing dissociation to have. So we know a great deal about depersonalization, derealization disorders, and there's another video on this channel that outlines the sort of the, the, the depth and the, the variety of these kind of disorders. But they're often overlooked, and, and this is something that I'll talk about quite a bit, is that often the, the sort of the majority of the work in, in research and things tends to go towards things like dissociative identity disorder, DID, and actually the, the look at depersonalization and derealization sometimes that just that doesn't receive the same amount of interest from sort of academic and research publications. So when a, a study or a, a paper comes across that really focuses on depersonalization and derealization or DPDR, then I think it's of great interest. And what this one contains is prevalence rates from numbers of different countries across the world. So it's a very good stratified sample. There are limitations with the paper um, because we're still looking at fairly small numbers of papers that have been published in this area, and that is a problem. And some of the case numbers are going to be quite low, but it's a start point for helping us understand exactly what the sort of the depth and the breadth of the problem associated with DPDR um, experiences is like for people. And what this paper is trying to achieve is to give an overview on how kind of common is it for DPDR populations to exist in three different population groups. So one looking at the general population, which is the sort of the non-psychiatric sample, one looking at the psychiatric sample, and one looking at which is sort of outpatients, which are kind of well enough to be, you know, just doing their own thing, but having contact with mental health services. And then the inpatient population, which is obviously the more severe end of the group. And it's going to be measured against looking at um, various different factors. So to try and assess the prevalence across a number of different things. And partly some of this is around specific disorders that might be alongside the DPDR. And partly some of this is about the sort of the histories that people might bring um, to when they're being assessed for this. Now, the paper sets out to, to demonstrate that the way that the prevalence rates have been measured in all the different studies was through validated tools. So these were assessed using sort of well-known tools for looking at um, various different types of dissociative disorders, um, stuff that's quite familiar. So things like the DES or the, the SCID-D, for example, things like that. So uh, it, it clearly lays out what tools have been used and which countries have used which tools and which sort of subset of populations have been used. So obviously I'm going to leave a, uh, a link in the description at the end of the, the video in the text um, so that people can access this. It's an open access article, which means you don't need to be signed up to anything. You can just click the link. It'll take you straight to the article and you can read the whole thing, which is worth reading. There's some really good information here. So for people that have got DPDR or interested in that field, it's got a great deal of uh, data locked into that um, article, which is really, really helpful. And I'm going to put up a list of all the countries that, um, that the study sort of takes its data from. So these are these are individual studies that were taking place throughout the world. And this article gives an overview of each one of those. So here's a list of the, the countries through which this uh, data has been made available. So we have Turkey, Germany, the United States, Canada, Israel, Mexico, Northern Ireland, Puerto Rico, Serbia, Spain, Switzerland and the UK. That's a nice, that's a nice breadth of things. And again, I always like featuring that as a, as a key thing because it helps people understand that things like dissociation are not limited to particular countries or particular cultures. This is quite a wide thing. And obviously you can see here that there's an absence of um, things like the African continent and sort of Indian. There's not a lot going on there. So it's, it's still quite European, still quite sort of Western influenced in its take. There's quite a lot of South American stuff, which is good, but it does show that we have um, an onus on us really in terms of research to sort of expand our population, start looking at different groups. And that's going to be really important for the years to come. Mm, how quickly that happens is, is largely up for grabs. And when we're talking about prevalence data, we're looking at the number of people in any given population that experience a particular thing. So what we have here are some really interesting data to start with looking at the general population 
for this. So for DPDR, within the general population, the range is sort of between about 0.9% to 1.9%, which fits firmly within the general understood sort of prevalence rating in the general population of dissociative disorders at 1%. So it's showing that actually the proportion of DPDR can be higher than the overall spectrum of dissociative disorders in the general population. This number grows a lot when we look at the psychiatric or mental health outpatient studies. So we're looking at DPDR prevalence rates within that population between 5 and 20 percent. So uh, almost up to a fifth of people attending psychiatric outpatient settings almost anywhere in these countries are potentially also experiencing depersonalization and derealization disorder. And in the inpatient group this number grows again between up to 17 and a half to 42 percent. So that's nearly half in some studies of the inpatient population are experiencing a fairly significant form of dissociation, i.e. some form of depersonalization and derealization disorder. That's a lot. And my bet is that very few of the people are actually understood or being receiving any treatment for those sort of con for the conditions of dissociation because that's that tends to be what happens so in inpatient settings people may experience these things but they get lost within other presentations or or maybe that's not the reason that they were admitted in the first place so the focus is often on the other stuff that they may have been admitted for and the 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 data within this article pretty much bears that out because when we look at sort of comorbidity which is the other conditions that a person might have than the, just the one under study or scrutiny the numbers are pretty high in terms of what they're actually um, what they're actually experiencing so I'm going to go through a, a list now of the things that sort of the comorbid conditions and the associated levels of DPDR to start with we have substance abuse which the rates are between sort of two and six percent between 3 and 20% for anxiety, between 3 and 20% for other dissociative disorders, around 16% for schizophrenia, 17% for borderline personality disorder, around 50% for depression. And that thing with depression, it, it seems quite high, but only one study was done looking at depression. So again, we have to sort of factor in the possibility that that might not be all that representative. So what we can see here is that there's quite high proportions of dissociation, DPDR, present in people with things like substance abuse or uh, anxieties, possibly depression, and uh, things like personality disorders and schizophrenia, which again, these, this is no surprise to us, but it's good data to be able to look at. The other interesting factor then from the study was looking at the sort of the, the life history and the experiences of people leading up to the point where they would be sort of being assessed for a dissociative condition. And the highest level of uh, DPDR was found in people that had experienced interpersonal abuse. So often that's kind of violence between um, known people, partners, for example, or within sort of like parenting, family type arrangements. And that level of prevalence will say between 25 and 54 percent, which is it, which is huge. So the, the conclusions of this study are that the, the general population of dissociative disorders is quite understood, sort of between one and two percent. It goes up a great deal in mental health settings and it goes up even further in, in, in inpatient settings. And people with histories of interpersonal abuse really, really are the kind of the highest risk factor for um, dissociative disorders being present. And the study really takes uh, a lot of time. Uh, the article takes a lot of time really to try and uh, explain what some of these things mean. And I would encourage people to dig into the article and have a read of those things. It also says there's a, some age related information saying that the, uh, the, the highest levels of DPDR were found in the sort of the young population. So the younger adults are the ones that are most likely to experience this type of phenomena. So that's obviously of great concern because we know that that's, our, that's an, often a very difficult group of people to actually um, work with and understand and bring into settings where they can be helped with things like DPDR. So I hope that's been useful. Uh, it's, a, it's a quick overview of a very, very well put together article which is drawing together, doing an analysis of many different studies that have taken place across the world bringing all that data together and giving us a, an understanding of the, the size and of the problem, um, which is often an unmet need, which is demonstrating to us sort of how prevalent depersonalization and derealization disorders actually are, 
in general populations, psychiatric populations and inpatient populations. So it's always good to go back to, especially when we're discussing people who say that they don't really think dissociation is a thing and it's quite rare and it doesn't really take place very much. It's this kind of article which absolutely blows that sort of statement out of the water and says it's actually this is a significant problem. It's just not a problem that it really is having much done about it. So we start with the data and that data informs the way that services are built and designed to promote treatment options and therapy pathways for people experiencing these sort of conditions. So thanks very much. Be interested in uh, hearing the comments and thoughts about this video. I'm going to be looking at more research articles as we go along. And in between now and the next video, as always, please do take great care.